Last month's Italian earthquake couldn't have come at a worse time. The economy has stalled yet again and poverty is at a 10-year high. My guest is the country's Europe Minister, Sandro Gozzi. Under pressure from poor economic results and the rising populist movement, how long can his government survive? Sandro Gozzi, welcome to Conflict Zone. Let's start, if we may, with the recent earthquakes. Um, the sense of tragedy, the sense of loss has given way in some quarters to anger. Anger that more wasn't done to ensure that the buildings were quake-proof. Why didn't the government do this? Why didn't they do more? Well, we, we should do more and we want to do more. But it's a big it, failing, it, isn't it? It is clear that uh, in the past, uh, Italy has mourned too much and uh, prevented not enough. And but that's this going is, on, isn't it? It's still the case. Well, it is why we proposed a big plan called uh, Casa Italia, Italia, Italian Home, uh, exactly because we want to avoid in the future this kind of uh, tragedy. And this is a major project to save lives, to save goods, but also I mean, uh, to uh, guarantee a better future for not only our people, but our beautiful country. Why don't you strengthen the penalties involved? Because your own statistics office says unlawful construction is of dimensions unparalleled in other advanced economies. Yes, the difference another, is people think here they can get away with it, don't they? Yeah, and they do get away with it. Another heavy burden of the past, and this is why uh, we have asked uh, a very good magistrate who has done an excellent job for the Expo in Milan, Raffaele Cantone, with the chair of the new anti-corruption authorities to verify everything has been done and to verify what we are going to do to rebuild because on this again we don't want to commit the mistake done in the past. But you need new sanctions. If you were serious about this we would see you rushing new legislation through Parliament, higher penalties and enforce more enforcement. Why, well, I, why are we not seeing this? Because I don't think that the problem in Italy are laws. Probably we've got too many laws. The issue is to enforce and properly enforce the law, law we have, and this is what we are, we are going to do. You won't take on the big vested interests, though, will you? You won't take on the mafia that is going to cream off some of the money that's going to be given for reconstruction. This is a perennial problem here. You've closed 200 municipal councils in Italy over the last 25 years because of infiltration by the mafia. You can't stop it, can you? Of course we can, and of course we can uh, face an important uh, project in our country uh, without uh, running the risk of uh, mafia action. Once again, uh, all the world watched uh, what we do, we, we do for the Expo in Milan. Big scandal of corruption, big scandal of mafia action around it. We run the risk of not having the uh, uh, world exhibition in Milan. We fought, we fought against organized crime, we fought against, fought against corruption, we, we organized a major event. We want to build on this experience because that proves that we can fight the illness of the past and we can show that Italy is a changing country. But your judges say something different. Just five months ago, Supreme Court judge Pier Camillo De Vigo said he believes corruption has been getting worse in recent years. He says the politicians haven't stopped stealing. They've stopped being ashamed of it, he said. Now they blatantly claim a right to do what they used to do secretly. That's not getting better. This is a major embarrassment for your government. Is it? Here's a senior judge, we, Supreme Court judge. I, 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 give you, I give you some figures. I don't want to uh, open a debate, uh, undirected debate with Pierre Camero da Vigo, who is uh, now the chair of the judges syndicate. So he knows he's what scary. he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. I also know that, for example, we have reduced by 40% the fraud against the Italian and the EU budget in the use of public funds only last year. And this is a major step ahead. What I don't share about uh, Davigo's view is that uh, he wants to condemn our country to uh, some uh, illnesses of the past. We think that uh, this country can change, that this country is changing and we are proving that we can do uh, much better and notably in a legal way. Even though he says things are, are still getting worse because your country is consistently ranked as the most corrupt country within the Eurozone, according to Transparency International. 
Yeah, this is not changing. This is changing, and this but is... But you're, uh, you're still ranked as the most corrupt this, country this, this, this in the is, Eurozone. This, this is changing, and, and this is why we took... Uh, uh, we, on this, on, to fight against corruption, we introduced new legislation. To fight against corruption, we create a, an anti-corruption authorities, and uh, we are getting results. Okay, let's, let's look at the brighter future that you're talking about as far as the economy is concerned. Um, growth has stalled for the latest quarter, zero growth in the second quarter of this year, and poverty is at a 10-year high. So your perspectives don't look that great, do they? Well, I mean, in the last uh, trimester, uh, Italy has done zero growth, France has done zero growth, the Eurozone has done 0.3%. Uh, I wouldn't take it that as a specific Italian problem. I would say that it's that. It's not, a, but, it, but it's, you're, you're common, always in the bottom. You're common, always in the bottom six or seven countries when well, it comes we, to growth. At the beginning of our government, we, we, we started from a minus two percent, and uh, I think that uh, already from minus two percent to uh, register a po plus a zero point eight percent of last year and working. To really boost growth is something that uh, is already an improvement. Of course, we are not satisfied. But you're the third biggest economy in the Eurozone, Minister, and running at half the average rate of growth in the Eurozone. Half the average rate. You take GDP growth in the first quarter of 2016. Average in the Eurozone was 0.6. Your figure, half of that, 0.3. Yes, of course. A country which has, not, has, has, has never done serious reform for the last 15 years. A country which has suffered more than others because of a wrong European therapy. A country which uh, is starting now to uh, uh, having a major structural reform, like the reform of the labor market, the reform of the justice, the reform of public administration. We hope, if we win the referendum, a major constitutional reform. It is clear that you cannot expect Italy to perform uh, as other countries with this uh, uh, with this backlog of work that it hasn't been done and that we have done in these two and a half years okay, and we are, we're going to continue to do it. But you've set targets that you're not going to meet, are you? I mean, you would need to grow by 1.3% in the last two quarters of this year to meet your goals for 2016. You're not going to grow at 1.3% for, for the I, final quarters I of think this that year, no, are you? Nobody is going to confirm the economic forecast of April and this is not uh, the Italian government saying it. If you look at the International Monetary Fund, it, it, to look at the OECD, they are all saying that uh, the, uh, uh, there will be economic slowdown compared to the economic force in April. Okay, because, but, but the uh, because IMF has given you a worse forecast than for the other countries in the Eurozone. Your economy, it said, won't return to pre-2008 levels until the mid-2020s, by which time the other Eurozone countries, it said, will be 20 to 25 percent larger. So your forecast is noticeably worse than for the other countries, isn't it? That, uh, to, that, uh, that must be seen. We, are, we got a better figure. But the point that, uh, I mean, we are doing uh, the reform effort which nobody has done before. And uh, uh, Italy needs many structural reforms. Some of them have been taken and they are going to be implemented, have been implemented. Some others still need to be taken. We cannot solve all the problem that we have accumu accumulated in almost two decades, in two years. And this is why we are so determined in moving ahead with our reform effort. You have two lost decades of growth, according to, to the IMF. And any recovery in the Italian economy is likely, they say, to be fragile and prolonged. But this is why we insist also on the fact that there are two main macro causes for this uh, Italian delay. The first, I told you, the time that Italy has wasted. The second, wrong th uh, therapy at European level. We and your Prime Minister has said also a third one, the uncertainty over the British exit from the European Union. But all, 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 the, all the major inter economic organizations are saying that uh, the slowdown in the last month is, is, uh, is due to three main reasons. The first is... Uh, the uh, terrorism, uh, terrorist attack. The second is the migratory crisis. The third is the uncertainty around Brexit. This is not only Prime Minister Renzi who said this. No, but all he... the major economic organizations were saying But that. what he did say was that the English are the ones who will feel the damage most. It's, it's almost as if he wants the British to suffer no, as a wrong. result that's of wrong. this. There, there, there is no uh, revenge uh, 
uh, or uh, less on giving uh, sentiment. It is clear that, I mean, we fully respect the choice of the Brits. Uh, we need now to focus on what needs to be done among 27, and notably within the Eurozone, and the new investment policy to boost growth. But it would be very uh, good it, it, for it, it, you it, it, if it, the it, British it, suffered, wouldn't it? No. Because Why? What, if they make a, what if they make a go of it? What if their economy grows? What if their employment grows? What if all the economic indicators turn green? How are you going to persuade your citizens here, who are laboring with 11.5% unemployment, that it's worth staying in the EU? Uh, that makes your job that much harder, doesn't it? My job is a very difficult one. <laughs> uh, the job of any... But a British you, success would make it even more difficult. I wish all the success to the Brits. I do not really? believe... I do not believe that the, it, it's the right choice. I fully respect the British choice. I think that it, it's a deeply wrong choice. And I think that uh, in the medium run, Britain will suffer from that and will re regret it. Whether... But it doesn't have the problems you have. It doesn't have 11.5% unemployment. Its employment level is 5%. Is, is unemployment level is 5%. It doesn't have 360 billion euros of bad debts in its banking, does it? Its public sector debt to GDP ratio is nowhere near the 132% that you have. Yeah, um, but if you have... And, and your prime minister says the Brits are going to suffer most. It doesn't look like it, I does it? Think, I think that the Brits are going to suffer from, for leaving uh, the biggest market in the world. They are going to suffer because they will not have uh, any possibility of having an influence, as they have got on a key decision-making process on issues which uh, are very relevant to employment and uh, economic growth in the Union. If we have 130% of public debt, it is not because of the European Union because of irresponsible policies that in Italy were done notably in the 80s. And my generation uh, is carrying a very, a very heavy weight from those irresponsible policies. But what you, blame, off on that. what you blame for your problems, partly, is austerity, isn't it? Of course. Last year, your finance minister said, um, and you've been complaining about austerity since, since 2014, but the irony is that you seem to want closer political union. Closer union with the body that's putting you into austerity that you are chafing against, that you hate so much. He, he, the union has been, in the last austerity decade, technocratic and not political, has just focused on very tight rules, has totally neglected the social impact of those austerity measures. This has, been, has got a devastating effect on countries. You country said it's like, destroying growth. Like, like, absolutely. You said it's destroying and, growth. And, I, I, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the fact that after 10 years of those recipe, Europe is not doing well, and those countries who have applied this recipe the most are not doing well. Germany is doing well. Demo well, Germany's um, doing well? This well, is your complaint, that it's 28 countries, or, or soon to be 27 countries, not just one. This was your Prime Minister's complaint, wasn't I, it? I do believe that Germany has mostly benefited from the Euro, has mostly benefited from the policies which have been, uh, which have been followed in the Eurozone. And I think that now it is the time also to uh, accommodate the need of country who needs to uh, relaunch growth. And I think that from one side, the quantitative easing of the European Central Bank is very good for the Eurozone, but this is not enough. What we're saying is that we need to do more at national European level for a new investment policy. But you Both disagree private with... private and public investment policy. You disagree on so much with, the other, with other countries. In the, you've had open rows with Germany, you've had open rows with the European Commission. Um, there's a lot of bad blood between Italy and other members of the uh, EU, isn't I, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say that at the moment, uh, I would say at the moment the relations between Italy and Germany are good, as the last uh, Italy-Germany summit proved. I think that we are converging. You recited some slogans with no. each other and a few cliches. It, are, didn't, it no. didn't say good relations we anywhere, are, did it? I give you an example on, of uh. a new strong political convergence between Italy and Germany. Migra my migration policy at EU level. And also the, need, the fact that we all agree that uh, we need to do more and better with the investment plan, the so-called Juncker plan.
and the fact that we need to do more for youth policies also at the European level. But in, and ju in January, Juncker criticised your Prime Minister openly. He said, I think he's wrong to offend the Commission at every opportunity. I don't see why he does it. And yeah. your Prime Minister replied, we won't be intimidated. Italy deserves respect. Yeah. It's pretty sad when it gets it down was, to that level, isn't it? It, it was, it was a a start, it was a, 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 an original uh, way of uh, understanding each other because that belonged to the recent past. But it showed a had, lot of misunderstanding. We, we have opened a new phase, and uh, the, the decision the Commission took uh, on uh, the Italian budget, the decision, uh, the, the proposal the Commission made on migration, the proposal the, the Commission made on relations between Europe and Africa, all go toward the right direction. And uh, I, we think that we need to foster our bilateral relations. I, I, I would think that change, things have changed a lot since January. Even, even though this seems like a body which is on the brink of falling apart. And I say that because Germany's Deputy Chancellor, Sigmar Gabriel, warned just days ago that unless the British exit from the EU was handled properly, the European Union, he said, would go down the drain. It's that fragile that you'll go down the drain I think if, the, that, if you get this wrong. I think that the union uh, is going through a very delicate phase. I think that uh, the union cannot afford, afford to remain in the status quo. And I think that the status quo could be the beginning of European disintegration. Whereas what we need is to relaunch on a new basis the European integration process. This is why immediately we have to give answer, proper answer, efficient answer, on growth, security, and youth. And next year, we have to think of a new political pact for the, the Union for a ever closer union. But these are not new tablets. This, you're not saying anything new that hasn't been you do, said. You, do, you don't it need to hasn't, be, hasn't been said for years. You don't need to be original. You just need to implement what we say. OK, but you know perfectly well when you're talking about the calls for unity, peace, freedom, getting dreams back, this is not a Europe that knows how to unite. There is no unity on the migrant crisis. Look at Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, for instance. Where was the Czech Republic when it came to wanting unity? It has relocated four people, okay? Yeah. Slovakia has relocated three. Hungary has relocated none. Poland has relocated. So there's no unity on the migrant issue. And you're not going to change their minds. They're certain about this. I think that that is shameful. I think that uh, it is shameful that after such a long negotiation, do we uh, done it uh, properly in the, in the full respect of the treaty, where in a democratic way we discuss among governments in the Council of Ministers, our direct elected member of the European Parliament took a decision, and then there are four or five uh, countries who are putting uh, who are paying a lip service to this e a decision, democratically taken. But this democratically is the taken EU. This is the level. EU of today. Uh, this this is, is what you have. This is why I'm telling you that we have to get out of the status quo. And certainly, we, to get out of the status quo, we need, we need both pragmatism and vision. But you also need the political to, will to implement. of the countries to do it, and you don't have that political will. Even fighting terrorism, you don't have the political will to exchange information. The head of Europol last year said that when it came to exchanging information in Europe, security information, Europe was a black hole. Exactly. A and black the, hole. And the result of this absurdity, it is, it is clear that you are facing transnational threats, and that you have to respond to transnational threat with the new transnational policy at European level on terrorism, on migration, on finance regulation. The, result, the fact that we have been so shy and we have lacked of political will in the previous years, what is the result? Growing populism, disaffection. 48% of Italians saying in May that they would like to leave the European why, Union. And this is why we cannot afford the status quo. Maybe you should let and, them. And this, well, I mean, I think that would so be... So desperate would be, to get out, be, let them be, go. No, uh, because I love too much my country to let my country go towards suicide. So I think that at the best. But choice, your country is in a best, terrible state, and you choice, blame a lot of it on the EU. The, well, the, the EU is part. As, as, the EU, uh, the policy which the EU has followed in the few in the recent years, bear a part of the responsibility for this uh, growing euroscepticism. A part.
But there Minister, is a good Minister there... if, if the EU does not have common solutions to pro common problems, what is its legitimacy? It has no legitimacy, does it? Uh, you are saying that you are explaining the reason for... You have no... For, this organisation has the, no legitimacy. You are, you are, you are, you are, you are uh, raising the reason for the lack of legitimacy of the EU and this is why we are saying it is time to deliver. And it is possible. It is possible to deliver immediately on the issues which are at the centre of citizens' worries, which are, again, I repeat, and this should be done from here to the Bratislava summit and from here to the end of the year. We need a new growth policy, a new investment policy. We, no, we need to do something serious about security and, and defence. And your chances of getting it are, are pretty slim. I want to look at one issue, um, the migrant issue, and in particular the shabby deal that the EU has done with Turkey, which is busy falling apart. How is it that, on the one hand, the EU can say your anti-terrorist law, Turkish anti-terrorist law, is too harsh, and yet you are still continuing to negotiate with a country that has collectively junked human rights, arrested thousands of lawyers, academics, judges, police. If the EU had some respect, self-respect, it would get up and leave the table, wouldn't it? You I wouldn't mean, keep negotiating it, with a country have, that does that to its We people. have been very clear. We have been very clear, and our Prime Minister was very clear also when we were negotiating the migration agreement between Turkey and UAE and the EU, which is so far is working, which is so far is working. Uh, and we were very clear that, I mean, there is no place. Minister, it's not in working. The future Only the 200, Union. 400, 200, 400 people have been relocated as a result it, it, of this. It's not working. It is, it, is, it is working between Turkey and Greece. It is, it is working at the border between Turkey, Turkey and the European Union. Turkey has withdrawn soldiers but, from but, the Aegean but, islands but because should, they were claimed to be part of should, the purge. No, it, 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 it is working so far, but we have been very clear there is no place in the present and the future of Europe for countries who do not respect rule of law, for countries who do not respect fundamental rights. And this is, uh, is true for everybody, even for countries within the European Union. And this is true also for Turkey. And yet you're about to reward them with visa-free access to Europe. Martin okay. Schultz, President of the European Parliament, said, OK, we have a little difficulty. This was this week in Ankara. He said we have some difficulties over the anti-terrorist law, but that doesn't mean we can't do a deal. He wasn't ruling out giving Turkey, this Turkey, visa-free access, rewarding the human rights abuses with visa-free access to Europe. On visa liberalisation, things are very clear. There are specific criteria to comply. It is not uh, a political decision. There are more than 70 criteria to comply. You're happy to until, reward until, human uh, rights until, abuses. Until Turkey or other countries who has applied for visa liberalisation have not complied with all the criteria, it is not possible to go ahead. And then it is also, you need also the approval of the European Parliament. And uh, of course, the European Parliament also will make its, its own assessment. So far, the European Parliament has been very clear on the need to comply with all the specific criteria which are foreseen. Let's talk about specific instances, I, not just Turkey, but I want to go back to the Italian student, uh, student Giulio Reggiani, who was tortured and murdered in Egypt at the beginning of the year. I'm sure you'll recall the case. He's a student. He was a student at Cambridge University. His body was found with evidence of torture. It's clear that the Egyptian authorities have provided no convincing explanation for why this is done. And his mother posed a question, posed a question to the Italian and the British government. As far as I know, she didn't get any answer. Why, if you're still treating Egypt as a friend, why do friends kill each other's children? Don't you think she deserves a, an answer to that question? Of course she deserves an answer, and this is why our Prime Minister, our Foreign Minister, who are directly dealing with this issue, have been very clear with the uh, uh, Egyptian authority and the Egyptian government we want all the truth. And they about take this no notice of tragical, it. Tragical event. They take no notice and we of are, it. We are, we are insisting on this line because. So why no sanctions against, against Egypt then? Now we, we want to focus on the truth. And uh, the, the thing that uh, our Prime Minister is taking very seriously, as has taken personally very seriously in the very beginning, and is continuing to work on it. The that. family has called for sanctions. Why no sanctions against Egypt? We are going, we are, we are, we are going to see. Uh, we are going to see what uh, the, the we, we want truth and we want answer from it. If you were serious, you would impose sanctions. 
I, I, uh, I would prefer uh, to, uh, to uh, repeat uh, uh, what is our official position and what our Prime Minister has said. We want all the truth from Egypt. What, what is more it important? It is not something which I did directly, by the way. Minister, what is more important, the torture and murder of one of your citizens or some business deals that the EU, the EU is pushing ahead with this association been, agreement we, with Egypt? For us, fundamental rights and rule of law come first, and this is why it is our government which during the, uh, the semester of the President of the European Union has launched a new rule of law process within the Union because we think that if there is something on which we have to focus as European, something that is strictly linked to European identity is rule of law and fundamental right. This is true. Within the Union, this must be true more and more in our relations of, for, for, with the all our countries. The family of Giulio Regeni wants more from you. And they, are, and they, and they deserve more, and we want to, uh, to have all the truths about this tragical event. Sandro Gozzi, good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much. Thank you.